talking about is elaboration. It's a long-term memory uh, technique where <clears throat> what you're talking about, you're making associations to make remembering it easier. And this is like one of the strongest ways to memorize something that's really kind of abstract or just you're not getting it stuck in your brain. You're adding to the material or changing it in some way to make it to almost like a reminder. Welcome back to Out of the Box Podcast, where Steele and I, your host, get to talk about out of the box ideas. Today, we are going to be talking about how we learn things and specifically different ways of learning and also getting into a little bit of the psychology of learning, uh, different ways to optimize how we learn. Um, You know, coming from two people that love learning, I think this is going to be a really fun episode. And before we get actually started, I want to invite you guys to subscribe to our channel because our commitment to uh, provide amazing content for you guys uh, here through our episodes uh, will continue forever and ever. And so um, I want to invite you to subscribe to our channel. And so without further ado, Steel, so uh, you know how there's different levels or ways of learning, right? We have kinesthetic learners who have to work on something to actually learn we have listeners we have um auditory learners um what else i think those are the visual right. our visual learners yep. visual learners definitely means- what, what would you say your biggest one is for you Steel? uh visual learning and then hands-on practical experience learning yeah yeah what about you yeah i'm i'm by far a kinesthetic learner and then a visual learner. It's hard for me to retain things like just auditorily. Right, right. right. Yeah, I, I forget people's names and you know, it's, it's hard uh, in class because you know, especially when it's just lecture and no like interaction, it's really hard to to take in information. No, classes, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, like it makes me think like, well, you know, how are are our education system is set up right now, you know, where, where sometimes it is almost like just lecture and, you know, no, no interaction. You know, I think one of the reasons why I was really good at mathematics was just because it was like something you learn by doing, you know, you need to do math, you know, of course, like academic, you know, university level math can start to get into theories and, and that sort of thing. But the essential of math is just very, hands on, you have to kind of do it, right? I think that's why I was kind of good at math. But, you know, for other subjects, like, is there other things that, that you have found in yourself, like that have helped you learn? Um, Or maybe even something you've learned in psychology that, that might apply to this? Yeah, I I could go on both of those. So like, um, what I learned technique that I started using to study that started turning, you know, B's to like A's on tests and stuff was, um, you know, rewriting my notes. And, and that does tie into with psychology because, you know, that's how you learn things. And many people don't really know how we learn, how we really learn things. Right. You know, like the, everyone says cramming before a test is not really going to work very well for you. You know, it might, you might retain some of the information and do fairly well on the tests might make a decent score it might pass you know and it might help you get by and it might be easier um but you know you don't tend to retain that information as much and there's a reason why it's because the brain just isn't really wired to learn things that way the way we learn things is through repeated prolonged exposure and so like what does that mean well that means um you you study something a little bit each day um, give or take five to seven days, sometimes maybe four days before like the test or before your goal of learning that thing. And you study not eight hours a day, not four hours a day, but maybe like, you know, one to three hours, depending on how much you need to study. At least that's what I did. Like I would study maybe one or two hours a day and about like five. And you know, that I remember telling you five or seven days before an exam and it would be like so easy. Like, I just know it. I just know it, you know? Because what you're doing with your brain 
is you're reminding yourself each day with the same material each day that this is important. Like it's almost like you're talking to your subconscious mind in some way, like saying, hey, this is important. And when you write stuff down, when you highlight things, your brain is, you're telling your brain, you're communicating to your brain that this information is important. And if you do it every single day, your brain is being exposed to that. Those, those uh, synapses between your neurons are getting strengthened each time you expose yourself to the same information again uh, each day. And then remember we talked about before, we learn the most when we're sleeping. That's mm-hmm. when the brain learns when we're asleep because that's when all the connections are organized and strengthened. So it's like, yeah, after days and nights of the same information, you're eventually going to just have it, you know? Yeah. Go from short term to long term memory. Yeah. yeah, and even uh, you know, we've all heard of the ten thousand hour rule, right? Have you heard of that before? I have not. And so basically, <laughs> uh, basically the ten thousand hour rule is basically saying that you need ten thousand hours of doing something repetitively to actually become a pro at something. So in order to be a pro at singing, you need to practice singing for at least 10,000 hours. After that, you know, it's probably, you know, a good chance that you'll be a good pro. But I, I've heard other people that say, well, you know, yes, it's 10,000 hours, but of dedicated learning, like focused learning, not just like practice, like, well, you know, I'm just going to practice. Um, this one song 10,000 times, you know, or like 10,000 for an hour and, and, uh, for 10,000 days, for example, you know, well, by, by 10,000 days, you know, you'll probably have the song pretty well mastered, but, you know, maybe you could have learned some other skills that were not on that song. Maybe it was just like a lullaby, you know, and, you know, yeah, I mean, you, you, you mastered it. You, you, you have it down, but you never got to experience opera. You never got to experience jazz. You never got to experience all these other subjects that could have helped you form your, your singing much better. And so, you know, maybe there, there might be some arguments there, but I, I think that for sure it's uh, 10,000 hours of dedicated learning can help you become a master at something, a, a focused learning. And by that, I mean like really really taking, breaking down what it means to be a master at something and breaking it down into simpler and easy to, to use steps, right? If I want to learn how to uh, speak French, well, you know, at first I have to start learning the words, right? You know, how to pronounce the words and then afterwards, like create sentences with the words or maybe pick up uh, things that, I hear from songs or movies and maybe put English subtitles and try to make sense of what, what people are saying, yeah, start practicing about, myself. Yeah. Very it's a try and error. You're talking about different ways of learning the same thing, which that also helps too. Yeah. You're doing one way of learning, like writing notes, but you're also like watching movies with subtitles, for example. Yeah. Multiple types of exposure. So it's not just about, Oh, exposure. exposure. Yeah. It's also about multiple types of exposure, like the different ways to expose yourself. Flashcards, yeah. writing notes, highlighting, reading a book, watching stuff with subtitles if you're learning any language, just practicing it with someone else. Yeah. And I, I think, well, I don't know how it's been with other people's experience, but I really learned it pretty well when I was learning something in one class and then I could associate it with another class. I could see oh. the correlation between two different subjects, yes. but they both amplified to be able to understand each other even better. Right. So yeah. it was like, Oh, now I understand, you know, business in this business class, why this marketing strategy works because in my psychology class, we learned about color theory and how different colors affect, you know, the human uh, self. Right. And so that idea gets ingrained. And I, I guess it does go into what you're saying, like exposure in different forms helps you retain memory. Yeah, I was trying to remember the name for it. I don't know that what you're talking about is elaboration. It's a long term memory uh, technique where <clears throat> what you're talking about, you're making associations to make remembering it easier. And this is like one of the strongest 
ways to memorize something that's really kind of abstract or just you're not getting it stuck in your brain, you're adding to the material or changing it in some way to make it to almost like a reminder, like you know, how you have reminders or something. This is where people use memory devices mm. like acronyms, like, you know, acronyms, like to remember. Yeah. Or you uh, make a joke with your, uh, with your classmates yeah. about it. Or yeah. You make it personal in some way. Like I remember this thing because it's then it reminds me of this character from my favorite movie. And that usually works. Cause then what you're doing theoretically, what they say you're doing is you already have a strong established memory connection in your brain of something familiar to you, like a, your favorite movie character going with that example. So when you're trying to learn something new, that's really abstract and hard to remember. And you find a way to connect that with some type of similarity between the two, you're taking a weak memory and you're strengthening it by connecting it and anchoring it to a strong memory that's already established in your brain. So of course it's like, it's like almost like hooking a line from your strong memory to the weak one. And then it's easier to remember now, you know, because you just think about that strong one and it just comes to you, you know, it just sets off a chain reaction and, yeah that's elaboration yeah uh, you think you think teachers teacher good teachers that are are teachers that really like know how to um spark a lot elaboration memory in in students you know because they're able to help students initiate that elaboration aspect within themselves you know like, let's say we're at a kid's uh, class, you know, and we're saying like the two, two plus two equals four. Well, you know, there was two minions, right? And right. then another two minions come by. Now we have how many minions? And it's like, oh, well, we have four, That's right? Four. And so like it helps uh, kids associate something that they might enjoy uh in the classroom or or outside of the classroom i should say with something that they're working on or maybe even writing a song about the the presidents or something you know yeah, things yeah, of that I sort i remember a lot of the stuff was with songs and stuff yeah yeah that's part of elaboration because you're adding to it you know you're adding to the material like a song you're turning it into a song you know so it makes it easier to remember a yeah, melody yeah. putting a melody to it same effect yeah. I've also heard that it really helps that when you study, you should study during nighttime, you know, or yeah, like probably, at least like two to three hours before you go yeah, to sleep. That's probably just because, because we it helps sinking. Yeah, because we learn at night. That's probably why. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's that's where uh, you know your your brain is start like what it does during sleep, it organizes thoughts or ideas that you've had throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And so that also includes new information, right? It, it starts, you know, associating that with other aspects of life, making uh, narrow connections between different things. And so I think that's primarily why people say like, well, you should study uh, at least two to three hours before you, you sleep, because that's where those thoughts and the, that new information will be organized in your head right right exactly yeah makes sense because um and th there's there's some something interesting about uh i i, I want to say like we we not only learn with our mind but we also learn with our heart and i and what i mean by that is that you know when people like a lot of people remember you know the first time they kissed someone or the first time that they I don't know, got to ride a bike, for example. And it's, it's, it's something that they remember really well because they, so, they associated something that, uh, a memory that they have with something joyful or something, uh, yeah. maybe even the opposite, maybe something that was very traumatic or very uh, hurtful. Yeah. And so that. when you apply that emotion to something you're learning, I think it has like, a deeper aspect so it's it's like a full embodiment of the information you're learning right yeah what you're talking about is like i believe is similar to like because when you kiss someone or you, or you ride a bike for the first time you have any exciting experience that's novel you know you're gonna have a surge of dopamine in your brain which mm -hmm. is a feel-good pleasurable chemical 
And then that's a very strong chemical because whatever is being associated with that chemical when it rises, well, you're going to want to do it again in the future. That's what we call rewards in classical and operant conditioning of psychology. You know, you have rewards and punishments. We avoid punishments in the future after experiencing them. We seek out rewards in the future after experiencing them. So like, it makes sense what you're saying. Like if you can, and I think that is a study technique, the more you can make studying enjoyable um, and find ways to even peak up your dopamine while studying something that you want to learn. Well, there's probably a higher chance you're going to remember it because you're making a very strong association when you're yeah. anything with dopamine, like what you, what you were talking about. Uh, I think, I mean, I, I don't know. This is kind of based on what I, what I think could happen. I don't know if this is fact, but it seems like if dopamine were to spike up during like a first kiss, for example, you know, of course that memory is going to be strengthened quite a bit. Cause if you go by, I don't know, like classical conditioning, operant conditioning, you know, the memory of that kiss is going to be strongly associated with that pleasurable sensation you felt during the kiss. So it's like, maybe that strengthens it. I don't know. And maybe yeah. that's why. And, and, and I, and I, I don't know too, too much about like what actually is going on in the brain, but for example, it, it could even like, you know, how you said with dopamine, um, that that's with a positive emotion, but it also happens the other way around okay. when you have a strong negative emotion, you also tend to remember those things as well, yeah. you know, and, and if, and of course, uh, you know, there's, there's more that we can get into like forgiveness and whatever, but, um, but, you know, they, these are like emotions that when they're tied to something like that we're learning can be amplified. For yeah. example, one of the things that I have heard of people doing before is like raising or elevating their their emotional state before uh, going to class or, or learning something. Just because when you're in a state of, you know, bliss, like where, where you're just like, completely like grateful or something like that you're able to grasp things a little bit more because there's no nothing really like stopping it from from coming in right i think that's one of the things that really makes school for some people really difficult because they're not emotionally engaged in the content that they're learning Motivation. you know they don't feel motivated to actually learn it and so you know it just goes into one ear it goes out through the other but if they actually are engaged emotionally, you know, you tap into the emotions of students. I think that could really flourish a lot of things in the education level, right? I think we, we overestimate the, the mental capacity and underestimate the emotional capacity in, in the school system. And I think that, you know, if both were, were looked the same way, I think we would see, um, you know, something different because if you think about it, when we go to school, we always look at, oh, what grades did we get? That that's like our standard of how good we're doing in school, but we don't look at that much at the emotional uh, improvements, right? Why why is that not even a thing, right? If both if learning is both an emotional and a logical aspect, right? right? And so I I think that might be an area of improvement, but I know talking about raising your your state, uh, I know you've uh, actually gotten into binaural beats and um, kind of engaging or using other senses to be able to to learn. Well, what is your experience on that? Like, or, or what would you say about like bringing in an external aspect to help you learn? Yeah. I mean, I don't see why not. Uh, if it helps, if it helps you learn better then it can, it's then keep doing it, you know, now binaural beats are one thing that I find interesting, but unfortunately there's not enough research on it. Scientific research, you know, but anecdotally I can speak for it and say, Hey, you know, it seems to have worked for me. It seems to, whether it's placebo effect or it actually does work, that's the scientific question. Yeah. But I just know that it's helped me, you know. Um, and it, it's maybe perhaps like just how they have like white noise or or even people have said to listen to classical music 
yeah, while they study. I, I usually listen to music I like when I study. So, or yeah, I mean, there's a lot of that. So maybe it helps. Maybe it helps tune out everything around you. It does, you just yeah. focus on yeah, on the one one thing, right? It it kind of trains your brain to like focus on what's in front of you. Yeah, I think it makes it because. Easy. I mean, nowadays we, we're, we're so distracted, you know, our peripheral vision yep. is just easily distracted by social media or, you know, emotional impulses. And so when we, when we train our, our mind, you know, through external things to just like, Hey, focus here, you know, a lot of people even say like, Hey, have a specific place where you study because you train your body to, you know, use that space specifically for work or for studying or for exercise you know you have a specific place where you go to actually do a specific task and if the environment has those same conditions over and over and over again it really conditions your body to to uh act in a certain way you know or or uh stay consistent and do a certain task for that you need to do that's true i mean yeah like i said it all comes down to associations i think was what i'm hearing you say kind of classical conditioning you know you associate or you know, operant conditioning too you know you associate a certain stimulus something in your environment with what your behavior you're doing and if you the association is like a reward meaning it's positive it gives you some form of pleasure you're more likely to do it you know mm-hmm. if it's a punishment you're less likely to do it so yeah i think like what you're saying, in the environment, we're creating a study environment and trying to only use it for studying or something like that or working. And yeah, you know, you're going to associate everything in that environment. This my filing cabinet, my computer, my desk. I'm going to associate those in my brain through like uh, operant conditioning with studying and work. So every time I come into this zone, I mm-hmm. my brain just is associated with it already. So it kind of just gets into it. That's what they say to avoid insomnia don't do work or anything else in bed you know because if not uh you're going to associate that with sleep and you're going to have a hard time sleeping because your brain's going to like go to the bed and think about those things right mm. sleep it's one example I yeah think getting out there yeah that's smart. yeah that's that's one of the things like that i i find so fascinating that the actual space where you do specific tasks mm. almost holds a, a memory in itself like the specific space where you are holds a memory in, in your internal self so that when you come in contact like when i go to the gym i just feel motivated i like i can't work out every day in my house just because it's i'm not conditioned for for it like i just don't have the same motivation to work out but when i go to the gym I just know that's, that's what I'm there to do. You know, I'm not there to like read or I'm not there to cook. I'm not there to do laundry. I'm not there to uh, put up my phone and uh, start working or send emails. That's not what I'm there to do. I'm there to do exercise. And and I think that really conditions the, the body to really guide what, what we do and tasks that we are, are doing. And I think in itself, we, we learn better when we actually have a place as well to that we condition for work or for studying or that sort of thing. So, yeah. Any I, final thoughts, Steel? I agree. I mean, associations, we underestimate them, you know, just one example of how we could underestimate it. I mean, a drug treatment, if someone is trying not to relapse on drugs, part of treatment for drug addiction or drug dependence, I should say, is not to go around the same people or places that you were around when you were using the drug, because that's going to increase your chances significantly of relapsing because your brain, like I just said, you know, like we've been saying, is, has associated the people and environments you use the drugs in with those drugs. So you're more likely to fall back into old behaviors. Yeah, that'd be my final like example, you know, like, yeah, I really like that. I really like that because, you know, association can, can work for good. Like we were talking about, but like also for bad. So if we're trying to, we're trying to train or teach ourselves, you know, to do something 
or to not do something that we were so used to doing, you know, that that was maybe negative to our bodies or to our, our surrounding. It's, it's hard because sometimes, you know, we come back to the same environment each and every single day. Right. Mm -hmm. For example, somebody that does drugs and like they still live and their provider or their dealer was their neighbor. Well, you know, it's kind of hard to leave, you know, because if they see them every day, almost, you know, yeah, that's why it's, it's kind of hard to say that's no. Hard. Yeah. You have to try to get them to hopefully go to a different environment, move to a different house, a different room. Yeah, yes. Really, yeah. Cause you stay in the, yeah, yeah. The same environment you stay in a cycle right and i think that's that's what triggers coming back into things yeah. the memories come back yeah exactly. dang well we'll leave it at that i think that's that's a really interesting thought uh we'll linger with that and guys it, and girls also if you guys um have come to the end of this podcast we really appreciate your time we really appreciate you listening to us and we would also like to know what you are thinking uh, of the content we're providing. Uh, please leave us a, a like down below if you like this content. Uh, send us a message as well. Uh, we would like to hear from you guys. And also subscribe to our channel because we will continue providing amazing content for you guys. Um, and so until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.